diving is unlike anything anything else. It's a completely foreign and alien environment. There's nothing of uh, everyday life uh, involved in diving. Uh, you know, there's no uh, eating or drinking or talking or uh, you know, it's just it's just you and what you're doing. That's all. The appeal of shipwreck diving in Lake Erie is to me that uh, the wrecks are preserved better than they are other places in the world. We don't have salt water, so they don't deteriorate. Uh, the zebra mussels cover them completely in most cases, but um, other than that, they're very well preserved. 150, 200 year old shipwrecks are still well preserved where you won't have that in salt water. So when you go down on a shipwreck, um, you can see zebra mussels covering almost the entire structure. So they use these little things called bissel threads that come out of the two shells, out of the bivalve, and attach. And it's almost like, like a Velcro or a sticky substance that attaches pretty firmly. Here in the Great Lakes, we have the zebra mussels, which are native to the Caspian Sea in Russia. And uh, they have their own little niche in that ecosystem there. There's two types. Everyone seems to be more familiar with the zebra mussels, but there are also quagga mussels. And their goal in life in the larval stage is to find some type of substrate to attach themselves to and grow. And one female zebra mussel can produce one million eggs in one year. So it was all an exponential uh, uh, explosion of an invasive species it took to this new environment. So with the weather patterns, we see a lot of shipwrecks that occur here because those storms kicked up so quickly and, and you know, the intensity was so high. So um, boaters got caught out in, in weather that, um, you know, couldn't be navigated out of. So we do have a lot of shipwrecks there. And when we look at different aspects of water quality, um, one of the nice things is that we are freshwater and we are, you know, in the northern part of the United States. So it does, it's, the water stays relatively cold and depending on how deep the shipwreck is, that water might be even colder towards the bottom. And that helps preserve um, the shipwrecks compared to other places in the world that have shipwrecks. Lake Erie has thousands of wrecks in it. Uh, all of the Great Lakes do. Uh, Lake Erie is a little bit special though because uh, Lake Erie has a perfect storm of ingredients that, that make it a bit more hazardous than, than some of the, the other Great Lakes. Uh, when autumn comes, uh, October, November, uh, shipping magnets were trying to make that final run and October and November have also happens to be when the weather changes and back when we couldn't forecast the weather that well, uh, ships would get caught out in this perfect storm of an area, uh, winds would whip up and because Lake Erie is so shallow, the waves would go from 3 or 4 feet to 20 or 30 feet in 30 or 40 minutes, uh, which didn't allow much time for mariners to make it to safe harbor. They'd take on water, they'd founder and down they go. Between New York, Ohio, and the Canadian border, we have 76 miles of shoreline. And within that box, there's an estimated 196 shipwrecks. And as many as 250 more that are undiscovered. And with those kind of variances, we realize that we really don't know what we have down there. It's never been fully surveyed. The S.K. Martin was known when she was afloat by the mariners as the Skinny Martin. Uh, the S.K. I suppose being the skinny part of that. Uh, she was uh, sailing from Buffalo, New York to Erie, Pennsylvania with a load of coal. She was very heavily loaded with coal and uh, she sprang a leak um, at a time when the winds were starting to pick up. And she went down in October of 1912 and started taking on water and the captain quickly realized that the, the ship was lost. Um, she was going down, 
He ordered the crew of 11 into the, the yawl, which is a, a very long boat that uh, they used to try to row to shore. So as the ship was going down, these poor folks were in some very rough, violent, wavy weather trying to make it to shore. Um, as fortune would have it, uh, the crew of 11 did make it, but they had quite the experience getting from the boat uh, as it was going down to the shore. Uh, nowadays, uh, some, well, 100 plus years later, uh, the Skinny Martins lying in about 58 feet of water, which is a perfect depth for a uh, beginning scuba diver to kind of uh, uh, stretch their, their legs a little bit, as it were, uh, on some, some uh, more challenging dives, but that are still within their, their capabilities with a qualified individual tagging along with them. Uh, she was carrying a load of coal. The coal is still visible in the holds. Uh, the holds are still, most of the, the hatches are still visible. You can see ship when you see the wreck. She is starting to collapse, uh, has collapsed over the years. So the deck uh, has sunk down a little bit. The sides have splayed out. Uh, you can make out the boiler, which is the most prominent feature on the wreck. The uh, housing, the hut that contains the boiler probably blew off when the air got trapped in the ship as she was going down and got a little bit compressed and just blew the, the structure off. Uh, so you can still see some um, um, some uprights of the, uh, the framing of the, the hut, but the boiler, as I mentioned, is the most prominent feature on this wreck. Visibility on the, the Martin, like visibility anywhere in, in the Great Lakes, varies. Uh, Lake Erie in particular, we, we, uh, because we're the shallowest of the Great Lakes, uh, our visibility tends to be a little less than, than nominal. Uh, on the Martin, for example, I've experienced visibility as wonderful as 30 feet and as poor as less than 5 feet. Uh, it, it depends on the type of the time of year. Uh, early in the season, May, June, uh, you can expect the thermal climb to be higher, uh, which means that there's going to be a layer of cold water, say below 40 feet, which is, uh, of course, the Martin's below that, and the colder water doesn't allow the particulates to be as uh, readily dissolved in it as it does a warmer temperature. So things tend to be clearer earlier in the season, but it also means you're going to be diving in colder water, so you have to take that in consideration when you're planning your dive. The Philip Armour sank in November of 1915. She was carrying soft coal when she went down. As a matter of fact, she was, oh, probably towards the end of her life. Um, she got caught in one of those November gales that uh, sinks many of the ships in Lake Erie and the Great Lakes in general. Uh, she took on water. She had a crew of, I believe, 10. She was being towed by another vessel. And uh, when she started taking on water, they had to cut her loose, obviously. Rescue vessel came out, rescued three crewmen off the vessel. Seven of the other ones, including the captain, refused to leave the ship. Uh, no sooner had the rescue vessel left when the ship broke in two and really started taking on water. Uh, the rescue ship came back and rescued the other seven. So uh, no fatalities on this ship. Uh, the nice thing about the uh, armor is that it's in 30 feet of water. So it's a recreational, very shallow dive. If you get to it in the early season, you can have some de uh, decent visibility. If you get to it, uh, you know, before mid-July, typically you'll have 10, 15 foot visibility possibly, uh, which is good <laughs> for shallow <laughs> Lake Erie diving. Um, if you get it later in the season, it's not going to be as good. Today, the armor lies in 30, 33 feet of water. Uh, the most prominent feature, like on many wrecks, is the boiler. 
the armor boiler is lying off the wreck as if we think it rolled off when it sank. It's not too far away, but it's it's huge. It's uh, if you could crawl inside of it, which you could almost do, uh, you could fit two or three people inside. In the boiler, there is a um, a catfish. Uh, a pair of catfish have made one of the boilers their home. Uh, so the, the boiler's open, you can peer into it, and this cavernous kind of uh, contraption that's under the water and see this huge uh, catfish. Usually mama's the one that's hanging out. Of course, we try not to disturb her, we just kind of poke in, uh, maybe shine a flashlight in a little bit off to the side and uh, just take a peek, and maybe take a picture, and then go on our way to leave her alone. Uh, but that's one of the, the nice things about the armor, is seeing this three to four foot catfish that's just hanging out. My number one attraction to the Philip Armor is the marine life. The marine life that's drawn to that wreck in particular uh, is more abundant than I've seen on any other uh, Lake Erie shipwreck. There is walleye almost always on that wreck as well as uh, large schools of perch, bass. There's uh, several catfish that live inside the boiler. Uh, so marine life is, is, a, is a big draw. But they, the shipwrecks also provide habitat to different species of fish. And some of our video footage have shown like um, largemouth bass or bowfin or yellow perch, uh, walleye, all these different fish because it's almost like an artificial reef. You have structure there, you have places where the fish can hide, um, and so that acts as a, um, almost like a home or like a reef for these fish. The armor has a pretty impressive prop, and they say that it's on top of another shipwreck, which has a prop right below it. I haven't seen that, but I've heard from several other divers that it, that, uh, that that's uh, something that that has. The armor's propeller is sticking straight up. It's huge. It's about as tall as a human being. And uh, it's almost as pristine as it was when it was churning revolutions and propelling the armor forward. It's a very noticeable feature with blades sticking out. Uh, usually the propeller on some wrecks is embedded into the bottom of the lake, but uh, the armor's is, is very prominent and sticking out. It's a great photo opportunity, a great backdrop for a photo. I mean, this is a wonderful one for uh, basic scuba divers to, to go on because it's, um, it's very accessible. It's uh, very close to what, they, what scuba, basic scuba divers experience in their open water dives when they were with an instructor. The Armour is one of our favorite places other than the Martin to take beginning scuba divers, largely because of its accessible depth. It's at about 33, 35 feet of depth which is maybe twice the depth that they experienced when they were in a pool, uh, beginning divers. So it's readily accessible. It's not something that we really have to worry about um, somebody making an emergency ascent. It's, uh, uh, the pressure on you is basically only one atmosphere, one atmosphere being 34 feet of fresh water, which obviously the Great Lakes are. So the armor is just so readily accessible. It's one of those wrecks that we actually like to take people out to when they're diving in Lake Erie for the first time because it adjusts them or gets them experienced to the visibility, the colder temperatures, uh, all those things that you don't really um, get kind of exposed to when you're diving in a pool or diving in the Caribbean. So it's a great, fantastic first step into Great Lakes diving. The Kenobi uh, was actually uh, intentionally sunk, uh, 1921 I believe it was. She was an old war horse of a, of a boat and she got caught in 
um, a gale in, in November of 1921. She got battered and pummeled, but uh, um, she was too stubborn to sink, and she was able to make it back into Erie. And uh, her owners decided you know, it just wasn't worth the cost and effort to try to fix her up and refit her to return to service. So they basically salvaged everything they could off of her, uh, pushed her off the, the, the dock and uh, set her ablaze. And she burned to the water line and sank. The Kenobi was actually my first open water dive. So, so yeah, as far as beginner divers, it is perfect for beginner divers. It's in 15 foot of water. So for the most part, you're far from danger. I've been to this wreck quite a number of times because she's such a wonderful wreck to take beginning students to. Uh, there's a lot to see, a lot of wildlife. She's a, a hot spot for fishermen going out. She's very near to shore, uh, which is why she's only in 15 feet of water. So you can see lots of bass, lots of perch, lots of sheep's head, lots of, lots of different kinds of animals. Uh, at night, uh, you can see some catfish come out to kind of feed some of the smaller two feet long catfish. Uh, some of the prominent features on the Kenobi include the propeller, which is huge. It's absolutely huge. As a matter of fact, some boaters need to be very careful if they have a uh, deep enough draft, they could run into the top part of the, the propeller. I know that that's happened before. And there's also a, a quite a large propeller, as well as a, a large boiler that a lot of the times uh, will sit out of the water. Uh, just just a, a little bit out of the water so as you're approaching on a boat you can see the ripple of the uh, of the boiler tapping against the surface of the water. The boiler lies oh, about 20 yards off the wreck off the uh, starboard side uh, towards the bow and there is a the Coast Guard has placed a hazardous uh, marker a buoy uh, very close to the boiler to to mark it to keep people away. Uh, but that boiler is, uh, is a, another prominent feature that uh, it's worth finding. It's a very large wreck. There's a lot to see. There's plenty of deck planking and, and timbers uh, uh, for, for quite a ways. You'll see all sorts of nooks and crannies, big, huge oaken uh, beams that uh, used to hold the deck up. Uh, and nice little places for critters to hide. So poking around in there is, uh, is always a joy. Uh, you can also see evidence of when she was burned to the waterline. You can still see the darkened oak timbers, uh, the burn marks on her, uh, which is kind of interesting. And knowing her history uh, kind of enlivens that a bit. For taking on so much uh, year after year, the winter is here. Um, being bombarded by the large packs of ice, it, it's in very good condition for being that close to shore. The, the Great Lakes, Lake Erie in particular, has a greater concentration of wrecks than uh, some of the more renowned uh, areas like the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, we have thousands of them, uh, and some of them haven't been found. Uh, Marquette Bessemer II, one of the largest ships to go down in Lake Erie, has never been found, to my knowledge. It's still out there. You know, the, for a lot of these, the, the tragedy involved um, this, this is the last thing that ever happened, you know, and, and as this shipwreck is, is as it was 150 years ago, uh, or 200 years ago, or 50 years ago, whenever it went down. Um, but that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty powerful to be able to do that, to be able to visit uh, these historical sites and, uh, and be a part of it. The, the other thing is all these shipwrecks are, are to be considered maritime graves. 
and that is of the highest uh, concern for our dive team, is this, these were places where sailors lost their lives. So that's another reason to, you know, that that's hollowed water, you know, where we dive and where the dive team dives and, you know, that we want to have respect for the, the, the mariners that lost their lives on Lake Erie and the Great Lakes.